truly world experts in personality. And this is a field that is, <laughs> um, we couldn't have recruited better. I don't know how we got so lucky to get them all. Suzanne Segerstrom, thank you for helping me plan this. And so this is kind of a dream team. And I'm just gonna introduce Oliver and he's going to moderate. And um, when we end, Cliff Saren is gonna lead us through a before bedtime or pre-owl activity meditation. And the cafe is open till 10 and there's a fire pit in front of it. And so I encourage you guys to either go to the hot tub after the meditation or up there to hang out. And tomorrow night, just as a reminder, Cliff Saren's wife, Barbara Begotten, is gonna be playing cello, probably right here at the amphitheater. Um, so I think that's all the announcements. Actually, one more announcement before I introduce Oliver. All right. Well, um, thanks everybody for trotting down the hill after dinner to join us for this wonderful session that we're about to have. I asked for two minutes because um, uh, in two minutes, we're going to say that uh, we're going to summarize what Alyssa has done in two years. No. <laughs> uh, so uh, usually, so I'm the I told you. immediate past president of APMR and Anna's the incoming president of APMR. And usually it's a year um, without a pandemic and all the headaches and stuff. And I can tell you from experience, uh, Alyssa has gone above and beyond. We know she's a force of nature. <laughs> we wanted to do, we wanted to acknowledge you in greater than, you know, the, the typical thing with the plaque and blah, 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 that will happen. But could you come up here, here a moment, please? Can you go up there? So you have a gift that you have to just shred open real quickly. And you'll see why this wow. is your gift. I love the material. What could it be? What does it oh say? Oh my God, what that's so say? sweet. Everything is possible. It's beautiful. And here are cards from uh, oh, So congratulations, that's all we needed. Um, it was it was work of joy. I truly did get bitchy several times. So I, I no one, very few people know that. But if you were at the, if you emailed me at the wrong time, you probably didn't get a nice reply. I'm just kidding. Um, it was really a pleasure and a joy to create something for my friends and to see you guys here enjoying it is over the top. I'm so happy and I can finally relax because I don't have to be on the stage again. Um, so, but I am just going to tell you how pleased I am to have all of you imported for us for this important event. And it was so unique. We decided, even though we're not sharing it virtually, because this is kind of the treat of coming here, we are going to videotape it and it's going to, we're going to sell it. Like it's going to, you know, be like the source of income for, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're not going to sell it. We're just going to have it um, because it's too precious not to record. So Oliver John is a professor at UC Berkeley who is a deep expert in personality. He's made many personality scales. He's trained so many people in the field. He won a teaching award. He won the senior contribution award from SBSB this year and many other awards. And he is just a deep thinker. And when I told him we were doing this, he drove down from Berkeley, even though it was hard to, there were a lot of complications, but he's like, I can't miss this. I have to be with my colleagues and, you know, talk about this topic. And he just thought it sounded like so much fun. He's a nerd just like us. So um, welcome to all of you, Oliver. Great, thank you. So I hate to disappoint you. Um, usually people think I'm John Oliver, but I'm actually, <laughs> I'm very boring. I am so sorry, okay? The wrong order. Now, um, the reason why uh, Elisa, pretended that this is just impossible to get four personality people on one stage is that we're known as the Bickersons. 
We don't actually ever agree with each other. And you can see in this lovely schematic, which we, somewhere, oh, do you have it over there? Great. Well, it's not, there we, there we go, okay. In this lovely schematic, there was the British invasion. You may think of the Beatles, I think of Cattell and Isink. And if you took, if you took uh, any you know, personality classes uh, in, uh, in grad school or undergrad, they ruled the roost. And the bad thing for the field was that they also didn't agree with each other. And they didn't agree with any of the others. So there were as many personality theories and models as there were personality psychologists, which was not really an ideal way uh, to run a field. And then something happened in the late 1980s. And you can see there's a little blue dwibble. So the, the, the red bars are the Brits, right? So we added Cattell and Ising together and the little blue bars is something that's called the big five. And they grew. And it's like, I mean, I, it's a little bit like the Berlin Wall and gay marriage. I, I thought, I literally thought this was not gonna happen in my lifetime. I thought I'd be dead before this puzzle of personality structure would be resolved. I mean, I, I, I resigned myself to this and then all these amazing things did happen. I'm still alive. <laughs> And look at what happened somehow, because this was a mediocre empirical solution to the problem, right? All the theoreticians, my colleague Jack Watt said, we're terrible, we hate this, not theory, where's the theory? But it works and it works in different places and with different people in different populations. And so uh, amazing, I mean, the, the Ising people, and Suzanne said this, the, the Ising people are still holding on. You see, there's still a red bar there. It's still visible, right? It's not a JND. I mean, I can see it, but uh, the big five really have helped to unify the field. So I thought I should tell you a little bit about pers what personality is before we get started to talk about change. Now, in one minute, it's the ocean model. If you can remember ocean, right? There's an ocean somewhere close to here. Then you have the big five. Oh, open minds, right? That's about exploration, being curious, and the, the key variables interest, conscientious self management, that's regulating ourselves, meeting standards, being here, you know, on time uh, for the session. E is engaging with others. Extroversion is terrible. People think of Jung. Think of engaging with others. Then you have the activation that's in there as well as that it's often social. And we think of this as the approach system. Are you sensitive, responsive to rewards or gains? Amity, agreeableness, terrible word. Never ever use that again if you can, right? Sounds like you're a pushover. So, you know, I mean, it's also an anti-woman, you know, label. It's like, because women care more about uh, others. The caregiving uh, system that Baldy talked about, that's what this is about. It's, is the other person your friend or is the other person your enemy? That's, that's what it fundamentally captures. And then finally, negative emotion. Again, neuroticism is the worst label. We can thank Isink for that. But it's really about vigilance, right? It's like there is an accident ahead, pay attention. So we, you don't want to have a zero score on this. That would be bad news because you'd be the first one to be killed. So this is about sensitivity to punishments and losses. And then I couldn't help myself to put a little dig in because when I started at Berkeley like 700 years ago, they were still, there was a group that was using the MBTI. I want you to know types don't exist. If somebody talks to you about personality types, you say, thank you very much. I heard definitively they don't exist. Um, one more thing about the big five, why are they big? Is it just because you study the stuff that's big? You know, you're, you're big, big ideas kind of guy, right? It's sort of uh, big data. No, it's a hierarchical model. So here are the, the ocean five, right? And you can see what's gonna happen. We're gonna go to the ocean 15, right? The movie, we need to expand it, right? Five is not enough to really crack the whole a uh, safe that we are going after. So if you think about this negative emotion regulation domain, right? Where we are like stress is, is, is unavoidable, right? So we have things that have to dealing with stress, self-confidence, frustration tolerance, or conscientious self-management really can be broken up into at least three major pieces, organization, 
productivity and responsibility. They are not the same things. They correlate about 0.5, right? But I have, I know lots of people who are super productive and you go into their office and you think that, you know, a, a storm has hit this office, right? So it, the lower level gives us more differentiations. And then if you are, if you were, um, you know, breastfed by, let's say, um, Walter Michel or Al Bandura, we get along with them now. It is shocking. So, so <laughs> Bandura has this lovely concept um, that, that, is, that is called uh, emotional self-efficacy. Where would that go? Ooh, that goes right with negative emotion regulation, right? Do you believe you can handle you know, stressful situations that you can come through an emergency. It's surprisingly <laughs> substantial correlations when you uh, take a close look. Or social self-efficacy, that's very much connected with engaging with others, right? So what we've seen is that there is sort of connection and interbreeding in a way that's very positive. And then the last thing I need to say is personality uh, is set like plaster was what we heard in the 1990s. And this is, I think, was the underlying theme for this um, uh, um, debate or, or, or a meeting tonight is that, is that really true? Is it really set like plaster? And uh, there's two um, possibilities to kind of study this. And um, Patrick is gonna say much more about this, but one is to sort of ask the question, is marriage possible? When I met my wife 25 years ago, was I completely nutty, you know, to make a prediction, a gamble for the next 40 years? Um, well, it's intuitive. I mean, Costa and McRae were not completely out to lunch, right? It's intuitive to say that if I wake up next to my wife and her personality has been completely transformed, right? Like in Metamorphosis, she's turned into a bug. Remember, that's Kafka, right? But if she had a complete personality transformation, that would be very upsetting to me. You know, I, I married that person that I thought was going to be sort of the same. Now, it turns out that those stability correlations, that is like, is she still the most open-minded person in the room? Uh, those stability correlations from 20 to 40 average only about 0.5. If you look at that, that red, you know, the, the red column. But as Brent Roberts has demonstrated in an influential literature review, things then stabilize. So from 40 to 60, that same 20 year period, things are more stable. So that's about the rank order. How about do people change in the same way? Normative or mean level change. And that's again, kind of a different way of looking at it. And um, so if you thought about, should you have that 20 year old pick you up from the airport or the 50 year old, I would always go for the 50 year old because you can see here is that they seem to be going up in conscientiousness and we'll certainly hear more, are we there yet? Right? If you have children, that's just the constant thing. Are we there yet? Yes, we are. So the speakers and plan for the night, we're gonna start with Patrick Hill. All right, from Washington University. Then we'll do Daniel Wojcik from Northwestern and Suzanne Segerstrom. It's all yours. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is a really exciting honor to uh, get to be at this meeting and uh, get to realize how much better your meetings are than our silly personality meetings. Um, I've learned I mean, the fruit's way better. Yeah. Um, uh, what I wanted to do today was kind of outline four general points um, that I think are influential for the talks today in this kind of debate. And one of which relates to something uh, Oliver just kind of set up for me, where we recently published a paper um, led by Vivka Blydorn and all of us as members of the Personality Change Consortium, which sounds like a really fancy title, um, that we were focused on the idea that personality traits do have policy relevance. If personality is predicting all these magical things like health, marriage, uh, work, every major life domain seems to be predicted by the five traits 
uh, that Oliver just mentioned. How can we impart that knowledge into our policy, both public policy and health policy? And we foolishly decided we're going to answer all of the main questions of personality in one table, um, which, of course, uh, this is all the answers right here, and we can stop the talk immediately. Um, the main thing I want to bring up, though, is for the first point, exactly like Oliver was saying, there is both stability and change. That even when rank order stability for these traits are relatively high, we find mean level trends across the lifespan. Uh, Dan's done a lot of work demonstrating that over the span of your life, you may change a half standard deviation or more on these traits. Uh, we also see inter-individual differences in patterns of change, which is really essential for thinking through what this may mean for the policy relevance regarding can we change personality, and if so, how? So that seems, uh, to borrow the phrase from uh, the first day, like a moonshot of sorts, uh, but it may not be as difficult as uh, we may think it is. So I borrow in a chart from my good friend and colleague, uh, Matthias Alamond, who points out that yes, try to target conscientiousness, that seems pretty daunting. But if we try to target the things under conscientiousness and build up to the dispositional level, it may be a little easier of a path. So when you look at some of these, focusing on the narrow level, like what are your specific situation responses, focusing on the medium level, what are your routines, your habits, and so forth, a lot of these targets should look pretty familiar to the audience here, that these are the same kinds of things that health psychologists and behavioral medicine researchers have been looking into for years. How do we change people's habits to make them healthier? How do we change uh, situation-specific responses to avoid substance use and so forth? So a lot of these ways to change personality may be quite similar to the ways that we would think about changing uh, health behaviors. And with that in mind, obviously, we know from that literature, it's not easy. But there are ways of going about it with targeted intervention programs. And that leads to kind of the third main point I want to make uh, comes from this meta analysis that uh, Brent Roberts and I published about four years ago, in which we were able to find 207 studies that looked at personality change. And you may think that seems kind of high, like that's a lot of interventions on personality. Well, actually, these are 207 studies that were intervening typically on something else altogether and happened to assess personality as part of the process. So we have pharmacological interventions, we have cognitive interventions, we have social interventions, we have therapy, and all of these different groups happened to assess personality measures and we were able to look at that and demonstrate that across these different studies, Interventions that on average lasted uh, 24 weeks uh, with great variability, both shorter and longer, were able to enact some pretty decent changes when it came to personality traits. So we just mentioned like over the span of your life, you may be changing a half to a full standard deviation. And here we're seeing change on average about a quarter of a standard deviation with one dot way up at the top which is uh, emotional stability or neuroticism. And if you think about pharmacological or therapeutic interventions, it probably makes sense why that trait might be among the most valuable in this, this meta-analysis of interventions. And this trait is also gonna be really important for the next speaker, as Dan will tell us a little bit about why changes in neuroticism are really important for health. So we now have some evidence that it changes. We have some idea that it might change uh, or be able to change in ways similar to how health psychologists have thought about things. And we have evidence that it can change uh, through, meta, like, through interventions that aren't even necessarily targeting personality change. So does that lead to health? Well, that's where we're kind of in a gray area. Uh, we're still stuck at this idea that I personally, my pet construct is a sense of purpose. We've been studying sense of purpose for 12 years now. And only this year was the first time that I have evidence that changes in sense of purpose might predict health down the road. 
So the great Emily Wilroth helped uh, with this project, led this project on how changes in sense of purpose during MIDAS were able to predict chronic conditions and self-rated health nine years later, above and beyond levels of sense of purpose. And this sounds really fascinating and uh, valuable until you realize the reason we're talking about nine years is we've got data here and we've got data nine years later. So we have nothing in the middle, despite the fact I just showed you a slide that shows personality can change quite a bit in that nine year span of time. We also, with only two tie points, can't roll out all the other things that change alongside sense of purpose. So all of these factors that we've shown in our lab to change along with sense of purpose are things that we all know predict health outcomes down the road. So with that, I'm going to leave with, we may have pretty good evidence for the three points. The fourth point is where we're kind of stuck right now. And all of these great people are going to help us to find uh, some, of that, some of those answers down the road. Thank you. Hello, oh, it works. Um, so I'll, uh, I know you want to get to the uh, debate portion where we argue with one another. So I'll, I'll go. I'll go as fast as I can. Um, I'm Dan Rosick. I'm at Northwestern. Uh, did the slide switch? Yeah. Oh, it just it just switched. There's a little bit of a a little bit of a delay. So the question for tonight, as it was posed to us, was. Can changing personality bring about change in some kind of health metric, such as you know mortality risk, you know, or but others, you know, disease onset, uh, medication adherence, you know, what, whatever your favorite health metric happens to be, you know, can bringing about change in personality can that bring about change in something else that we care about, like a health related uh, outcome? Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, this question draws on two uh, distinct uh, lines of inquiry. One is on personality predictions of mortality, and that dates to Howard Friedman's uh, uh, paper in, from 1993, uh, you know, showing that conscientiousness predicts mortality risk. Um, and then the second line of inquiry was uh, modeling the personality trajectories, that is estimation of intercepts and slopes. And uh, this dates back to the, fir the first paper was actually uh, done at Berkeley by uh, Connie Jones and Bill Meredith. Uh, they, they published that in Psych and Aging using latent growth models. Uh, and then I think the second one used multi-level models, and that was by uh, Ron Sparrow and myself, which was in Journal of Gerontology. Um, both of these papers um, found, as was discussed earlier, um, personality, uh, you can see, you, uh, you can see uh, change in the overall trajectory, that is the, you know, the, the, the sample level or the overall trajectory, you can see, you can observe personality change. But more importantly, and Pat had alluded to this, um, there are individual differences in change. That is, some people go up, some people go down. People go up, uh, when people go up, they go up. Um, some people go up a little bit, some people go up a lot, you know? So there's like, you know, there's like, there's, there's gradients of change. And then of course, some people are relatively stable. You can, you can definitely find some stable people, people who have a slope of zero. I think John Nussel wrote said something like the, uh, the a slope of zero is, uh, or stability is a special case of change. Cause it's like, it's like, it's like that zero point, you know, on, on the, if you look at all these different trajectories. So, so individual differences um, in change. And that's what we're trying to harness um, with regard to you know, the, the theory that kind of underlies this question. So it can be framed, it's not really, you know, I'm taking some liberties here. It's not really an Aristotelian syllogism, like, you know, you know, all, you know, all men are mortal, sorry, just make, you know, that whole thing, you know, uh, you know so, but it's, it's, I'm saying things, some liberties here, but it's, it's roughly that kind of logic, you know, that there's a couple of premises that, you know, personality can change, and that there's individual differences in change, um, and then there's another premise that personality is predictive of mortality risk and, and other uh, health outcomes, health behaviors, and so on, so ergo, personality change should be associated with changes in mortality risk, you know, or, you know, whatever your health, whatever, whatever your favorite health outcome happen, happens to be, um, I actually offered this hypothesis at a mini conference in uh, at Penn State in the uh, fall of 2004. Um and it got published in this chapter that Laura Carstensen and Warner Shai uh, in a book that they had edited that, but that came out of that conference. So this was like the one instance where I actually like hypothesized something in advance before doing the analysis. I mean, this is like, the, 
Go, was it? Yeah, you pre-registered. No, I don't know. This was before pre-registration. So we were all p-hacking back then. Everyone was just harking and p-hacking back in those days. This was before the replication you know, crisis. That, that, that wasn't until like 2010, 2011. So this is the one time I was like, yeah, you know, I have this idea. And I'm going to get it out there. And there is some videotape that exists at Penn State from 2004. So, so, so you can go back and, and find it. So this was actually kind of like, a, like an early pre-registration, you know, but, uh, but it turns out that uh, once we apply data, so Ron, Ron Sparrow and myself, you know, we, we were like, okay, well, what data do we have? Um, it turns out that there was one study, which, which, which you, what you would need are two things, uh, enough measurement occasions of personality to get good estimates of trajectories on enough people prior to death and enough people who had died after accruing enough measurement occasions, you know? And there was, there's one study that kind of fulfilled this and actually Dan Belsky uh, was putting up some slides on this study earlier to say, this is the normative age, the VA normative age study, which is based in Boston. So we used that particular study and we found that change in neuroticism and also change in uh, also level of neuroticism, both of those things, were uh, related to mortality risk. Uh, extroversion was not. Oh, by the way, those are the only two traits that we had enough measurement occasions on. And we, pub we published this in 2007. Um, but I, you know, since that time, I'm like, you know, we have to replicate this. You know, you know there's, there's just one study, you know, so, so um, enter Emily Wilroth, my postdoc, who was one of Oliver's uh, grad students at Berkeley and uh, is a postdoc of mine now at Northwestern. But just last week, signed her contract at Washington University, St. Louis. So she'll be a tenure track uh, professor uh, joining Pat Hill uh, next year, you know. So Emily Wilroth took, uh, is leading uh, the task of, 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 she found a number of studies that, that we thought have uh, you know, the, the requisite data. She found about 10 uh, data sets out there uh, where they, we have three of our measurement occasions of personality, uh, but it turns out that too many people have either not yet died, you know, or too many have died after just one or two measurement occasions, you know, you know, making the, you know, making the, the trajectory estimates kind of like, like difficult, you know, so at the moment, you know, uh, we really don't have uh, the data, we have, to, we have to wait, we have to have to wait for in some of the in these 10 studies for more personality, more, more measurement occasions of personality to accrue, uh, to get good trajectory estimates, and then we have to wait until enough people to die after that, you know, so um, so in a decade or two, we should have, you know, like many studies that have the requisite data. So for now, it's pretty much, you know, you know, does changing personality, you know, does, does that, you know, does personality change predict, you know, things like mortality risk? Well, it's, it's not clear. So stay tuned. But my last slide, and then I'll be done. Um, but there is some promise. Um, maybe there's an, another way, maybe we can get an answer sooner rather than later. One is, with what uh, Pat just talked about, you know, there was this meta-analysis that that was done that came out a few years ago, uh, showing you know that that inter that interventions that were meant for something else, you know, interventions that were meant you know like CBT or you know, SSRIs, interventions that were that were meant you know to to change some other kind of metric, um, you know. To lower depression, lower anxiety. It turns out they measured per they just happen to measure personality. You know, this is one of the other things they happen to measure. And and it, it turns out that those interventions do change personality. And some of that change was substantial. So uh, that meta-analysis in 2017 holds out some promise that, like, well, maybe we can get an answer to this, to this question of like, you know, can personality change uh, you know, move a health metric, you know, or be related to a health metric. Maybe we can get that sooner. Um, there's also um, a couple of other interesting developments. There's, I'll just mention one. There's the peach which actually stands for personality coach. Um, and this is uh, Matthias Alamond uh, in, at the University of Zurich and then his, uh, his uh, doctoral student, uh, Miriam Steger, who's now a, a postdoc at Brandeis University with Margie Lackman. Um, they uh, published in, uh, this got published in PNAS uh, last year. Um, they, it's a digital personality intervention app, you know, to like change personality with this app that they've developed. I think it's only available like in German. Is that right? Is that, I think... Oh, they have English now. Okay, for a while it was only German, <laughs> but and so um, so that's another promising development that you know perhaps we can see some personality change that comes out of the peach, and then we can see downstream, you know, are do we see some of these uh, like health changes in health outcomes that are, that are that are that that are you know that can, that can be associated with uh, the personality change that occurred earlier. So um, that's the promise for the future, and. Um, Thanks for your attention.
I have a disclosure to make. I have not worked with Emily Wilroth. I don't think we've ever met. I don't know. I should, should I feel hurt about that? I, should, I feel like I should feel hurt. Um, can you? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is specifically optimism and optimism change. Does optimism change? And if so, does that correlate with health change? Um, before I do that, though, I have to talk about the jingle jangle fallacy. Personality psychologists talk about it all the time. Um, does anybody know the jingle jangle fallacy? <gasps> you guys don't know that's the best fallacy ever. Okay, so um, I forget which one is jingle and which one is jangle, and maybe that's the point. But one fallacy is where two constructs with the same name actually measure different things. And one of them is where two constructs that measure the same thing have different names. So for example, do you know the difference between conscientiousness and grit? A genius grant. That's, uh, thank you. I'll be here all night. Um, so when it comes to optimism, there's actually different kinds of optimism. There's optimistic bias where people think they're slightly better than they actually are, that their future is a little bit brighter than it actually is. There is um, optimistic explanatory style, which is Martin Seligman's construct. And it has to do with explaining events as being caused by something external to you, something that's temporary and something that's controllable. Um, and then there's dispositional optimism, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I've put the um, optimism and pessimism items from the life orientation test up here, just so you can see what dispositional optimism looks like. Dispositional optimism, optimistic explanatory style, and optimistic biases are very weakly correlated with each other. So all of the stuff I'm gonna to say tonight does not apply to any of those other kinds of optimism. In fact, if I review your paper and you cite a, a optimistic explanatory style study to support your dispositional optimism hypothesis, I will have you for lunch. That is not acceptable. Okay, so we have dispositional optimism. Um, it sounds stable, right? It's dispositional optimism. How could it be anything but stable? Um, but in fact, it's not. Uh, these are the studies that I could find that measured dispositional optimism and correlated it over periods from one day to 10 years. And you can see that as the amount of time increases, the test retest correlation drops, and it drops pretty significantly. So it drops to um, by 10 years, it's below 0.3 or it's around 0.3. There's one study that found a 10 year test retest above 0.7. That's Karen Matthews. You're gonna have to ask her about that because I don't know how she managed it. But in general, over time, dispositional optimism does change. Um, you can also be optimistic about situations. So for a while I was doing studies with law students. They were stress studies and that's one of the more stressed populations you can find on campus. So in a way they were a convenience sample. Um, in this particular study, I measured their situational optimism five times over their first semester and into their second semester. And what you're looking at here, um, oh, the, the intra-class correlation for that was 0.45 across those, those five time points. So it was quite variable. Um, and the correlates of situational optimism changed over time. So when these law students started law school in August, the biggest correlate of their situational optimism was their dispositional optimism. That makes sense. They didn't have any other information to go on. That correlation decreases over time as they get more information about how they're doing in law school. And when their class rank comes out January and February, you can see that that becomes the biggest correlate of their um, optimism change. So different things um, will create optimism change. 
People have also looked at what correlates with changes in dispositional optimism, some of these studies that I showed in the previous graph. Um, so over one year, change in marital stress correlated with change in optimism. Over two years, the amount of pain interference experienced during those two years correlated with change in optimism, uh, changes in income and job insecurity. And over 10 years, um, I found that a larger social network size and a larger number of supervisees at work, so a kind of status measure, um, both correlated with changes in optimism. Uh, interestingly, optimism before starting law school predicted income, but income did not predict increases in optimism uh, in that sample. So we know that optimism changes. We sort of know why it changes. Is that relevant for health? Uh, these are the law students again. The baseline is before they start law school, and this is a 10-year follow-up. Um, this is chronic health, the number of, number of days that a chronic health symptom kept you feeling below par. And the beta weights on the left, the baseline, that's the prospective prediction. The bottom number, minus 0.49, is the contemporaneous prediction. The one on the right, minus 0.34, is the contemporaneous adjusting for baseline. So this is the change in dispositional optimism and the change in self-reported health symptoms. Um, Bill Chopik has found over four years in a larger sample, small but significant correlations between changes in dispositional optimism over four years and changes in self-rated health and in chronic diseases. Um, but these were very, very small correlations. These were correlations less than 0.1 in a very large sample. This is, again, I'm going to go back to the law students and to situational optimism. This is, I believe, the only biomarker study I could think of to look at. And um, what I did in the study, they, uh, they were having their situational optimism measured repeatedly. At each time, they had a delayed type hypersensitivity test. And the delayed type hypersensitivity reaction is the same one used in the TB test. In the TB test, they are looking for the presence of memory T cells. In the DTH test, we're looking at the strength of the response by those memory T cells. So we use an antigen that almost everybody's been exposed to. In law students, we could use mumps or we could use candida. Um, those are both things to which almost everybody has been exposed either by vaccination or just plain old picking it up. Um, and then what you see is you get this large red swelling on your arm. And in real life, bigger and redder and itchier is worse. But for the DTH, bigger and redder, we don't really care about itchier, um, is better. It means that that T cell system is responding more robustly. And there was a significant correlation between change in situational optimism and change in the DTH response. And you see five sort of randomly selected um, people here and their slopes with change in optimism on the x-axis and change in DTH on the y-axis. You can also see that there were some individual differences there. So there was a significant random slope. There was variability between people in their slopes. Um, we looked for predictors of that and did not find any among the variables that we had measured. The closest thing that we could find is that the correlation uh, was slightly stronger in men than in women, but that was not a significant difference. Um, okay, that's not what we're looking at. So there, there's some biomarker evidence. Um, there's not a lot. So I think at least in terms of optimism, what we're lacking, and this kind of piles on what um, Dan was saying, we're lacking studies that look at change in optimism, especially with obje objective changes in biomarkers or health outcomes. Um, and I will stop there and turn it back over to Oliver. Uh, 
Uh, thank you so much. This was just great. Um, I hate to disappoint the audience. There was nobody here who said um, personality is set like plaster at age 30, right? So um, do you have questions for each other? I thought that might be one of the things to do first and find out are there follow-up questions that we should ask? And if not, I have some questions prepared. And we can also, um, if you'd like to come to the mic, we can take questions from the audience too. So we're, we don't have to just debate and discuss between ourselves. We can talk to you as well. Um, but I'll, I'll start. And, and Dan, you were talking about uh, mortality studies, right? And I think it was, um, gosh, Sarah, Sarah, it was Sarah who, um, who said like mortality is like the ultimate health outcome. Um, and, and you were talking about that. And the, and the drawback of that is that you have to wait for enough people to die before you have enough power for your analysis. What would you, what would be your second choice? What would be your surrogate endpoints? Yeah, some, um... I would I would say a you know, disease onset, you know, um, uh, certainly some uh, you know bio biomarker outcomes, um, some uh, healthcare outcomes like uh, you know, you know, hospitalizations, uh, things like that, uh, uh, medication adherence, things you know, th things of that nature. You know, that would that would you know that would, obviously that happens before you before mortality happens, and so um, so those those are alternatives as as well. Um, the nice thing about mortality, though, is that, you know, there's, you can rule out, like, reverse, you know, causality, you know. Like, <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, that, yeah. Although, yeah, you know, be, you if do. You, if you're dead, you can't fill out personality. Right, but you, so. you do have to worry about that sort of um, terminal decline in well-being, right? So up to, what is it, about a year, year and a half before people die, they have changes in their affect, they have changes in some traits. So you do have to be a little careful when you get really close to death but uh that, yeah, that's, that's true. true i mean i'm i'm thinking we heard this morning about moving biomarkers back even farther right so there's frank disease there's morbidity and mortality but we can back up some more steps too so i think that some of the measures we heard about this morning um like some of the clock measures might be a way to start looking at personality change and the aging changes, even before the onset of morbidity. Um, ironically, that's also when people experience the most personality change. So that's a, you know, that, I think that would be an advantage is that is, as uh, we saw the, that rank order stability increases with age. And so you can get more variation in personality early in life. Okay, and I just ask a follow-up. So quality of life would not be an acceptable criterion to predict to because, I mean, my parents passed away at 94 and 92, but the last five years were not quite the same as some of those middle years, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so we talk about health yeah. span uh, here, behavioral medicine, health psychology. It's the how long you live with a reasonable quality of life. That's another possible outcome is looking at something like health span. And I should say, um, uh, one of the original members of this panel, uh, Howard Friedman, um, who uh, couldn't make it, um, uh, emailed me about a couple couple weeks ago and said, "Please mention that, like, you know, he he says that um, his his, um, his opinion is is that." Um, uh, until we understand the mechanisms that connect, uh, you know, per, um, a, like a good understanding of the mechanisms that connect, you know, personality and personality change to, you know, later, you know, downstream health outcomes like mortality. Um, he said, you know, we shouldn't be talking about, you know, he thinks, you know, he, that we shouldn't be talking about, um, you know, changing personality to affect, you know, those later health outcomes. He said, we need to understand the mechanisms. So I need to put in that plug for, um, uh, for from Howard. Um, and then, yes, like what, what are the, what are the, what, what comes in between? Is it health behaviors? Is it, you know, is, are there other physiological pathways that come in between? So that is essential to understand as well. Like what, yeah. what, you know, what, what are the conduits by which personality and personality change influence downstream health outcomes? Yeah. And I think, you know, another thing that you've done looking at biomarkers is thinking about interactions between personality traits, like 
neuroticism by conscientiousness interactions. And that opens up a whole nother can of worms, which is, do you need not just a change in conscientiousness, but also an accompanying change in neuroticism? Or is it, you know, is the main effect sufficient? Should we take a question from the audience? Are, are you ready? We need to get your mic, or is there one there? Yeah, this one here. Hi, uh, Ted Robles at UCLA. Um, first, I really appreciate your uh, having this panel today. Um, I'm sort of a closet personality psychology fan, and so I really love all the work on stability. You're out it now. Yeah, I'm out it now. Um, the second thing I'll say is uh, what I wanted to mention were, was was something about th this morning's session and Howard Friedman. And so now I'm like, uh-oh, all my material was taken, but I'll do it anyway. Um, you know, I gave a talk about 10 years ago uh, at Riverside and, and talking about some of my work and we looked at telomere length and, and then Howard pulled me aside later on. He's like, you know, biomarkers aren't all that great. And he kind of went on to describe the argument that he made in his annual review of psych article. Um, and I thought about that today because I kept wondering, and I'm, I'll be, it'll be interesting to see, maybe I'll get an email from him if he listens to this recording. I kept wondering what he would think about the talks this morning, because I mean, to your point, uh, Dan, you know, at, you know, like 10 years ago, you know, we were still sort of figuring out these mechanisms. But when you think about something like the, the Dunedin measure, um, where, you know, now it's sort of multifactorial body systems related to uh, these uh, uh, related to the um, to these changes in DNA, um, it's we're much further than we were e even a decade ago in sort of our understanding of these biomarkers. So, what I was going to say was just sort of I, I, I was thinking about that and how, like maybe today or like this meeting is a great opportunity. I, there's other people besides myself. I don't have access to panels uh, that have this kind of data, but it really like maybe now is the time for that kind of crosstalk around putting personality measures in these longitudinal studies where they do have these kinds of measures that Suzanne was talking about. Um, because I, we're much further along than we were, uh, you know, when at the time that, that Howard rightly was critical uh, of how we think about these biological markers. Yeah, and I think an important implication of what you've just said is if you are giving a personality measure, don't be like one and done, right? right? Yeah. Give your personality measure a baseline. But then if you have an intervention, give it again after your intervention. If you have a five-year follow-up, give it again at five years. Um, you know, I think hopefully we've convinced you that personality does change and um, you can get these prospective effects, but we need to know more about the dynamic effects. And we can only do that with people collecting the data, not just us, not just the big panel studies. Go ahead. Uh, Emily Hampson, by the way. No, Sarah Hampson. I got her. Now I got her. Now I got her first name wrong. Sarah Hampson was who I was thinking of. Go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> so when I look at personality uh, measures like Costa and McRae or Cloninger's uh, temperament and character inventory or you know, any of the others, um, they all have in common that. Um, you, you answer a, a long series of self-report questions about how you typically behave or how you typically think or how you typically feel. It's all sort of rep, retrospective um, appraisals of what you think about yourself uh, behaviorally, cognitively, emotionally, et cetera. Um, I'm just wondering if in all these years, has, have there been any progress in uh, sort of overcoming this? It seems like a kind of a primitive way of getting at whatever it is personality is about. Is it about the behaviors that people are, are talking about or is it about the emotions that they're talking about? Or um, is, it, is personality what they say about themselves as opposed to what they really are? Uh, have, have there really been any advances in, in measurement or in understanding of what actually you're talking about uh, when, when you're studying personality? Um, I think that's a really great point. And uh, like there's two things that immediately come to mind, one of which is similar to what uh, Suzanne was just saying. A lot of those measures, I, you're mentioning this kind of 
retrospective bias or retrospective reporting, but it's partly because it was designed with the idea that maybe personality didn't change all that much. So that's a, a fair critique of the measures uh, out there. And a lot of the work uh, like at WashU and uh, some of the work that Dan's postdocs are on uh, has tried to consider this at kind of a daily or more uh, momentary level of, you know, it, at this time, did you, uh, do something conscientious? Did you do something more agreeable and so forth? And I think there's been a lot of interesting work in that field of considering how, uh, like you're, you're alluding to this idea of a behavioral measure and trying to find a way to um, either by self-report or through an objective report of like, what are you currently doing? What are you currently thinking, feeling and so forth? And I think it's a really important avenue for us where some of these daily studies are helping us of, you know, we've started looking at two daily studies of uh, how purposeful do you feel today? How purposeful do you feel in this moment? And being able to see like during COVID, uh, the amount of stressors you were experiencing during the day played a big role in how purposeful you felt that day, rather than these kind of retrospective reports about in general, I feel like I have a sense of direction in my life and so forth. So I think that's a big avenue for us, uh, like that's currently going on and there's a lot of great work there, but also going forward, we think of these traits as constellations of thoughts, feelings and behaviors. And there's only been surprisingly a few studies that have really tried to capture these behavioral indicators that I, I know Josh Jackson had a study uh, 10 years ago, eight years ago on the behavioral indicators of conscientiousness and that's probably the one of the five that we have the best idea of behaviors about. Uh, when it comes to openness to experience, for instance, we weren't able to find a great idea of like, you, you know, this is the open behavior because there's so many different ways that somebody could be open to new experiences. So there you have to take a different strategy of, we were looking at diversity of activity or trying to think about you doing lots of different things rather than one thing specifically might be indicative of kind of what you're discussing here. And, and it leads to these really interesting challenges. Uh, we'll say interesting now, it's pretty annoying, but uh, interesting challenges to try to find these behavioral measures that can better map onto in the moment, how conscientious are you, that really fits into the uh, Alamont and Flukiger model, model as well. Yeah, there's also informant. Um, so you know, you've you've talked about uh, you know self-report, um, you know personality uh, measures, you know self-report measures of personality. But some people that use informant reports, Samin Vizier, who was at UC Davis for a long time, but not is now um, at the University of Melbourne. She regularly gets um, informant reports and and finds that you know it, it varies by trade. You know, so uh, neuro neuroticism is kind of you know the, the best reports of neuroticism are self-reports because you kind of know what's going on inside of you. But agreeableness is actually something that <laughs> most of the time other people can judge better than you you know and so so there's uh david funder at riverside and there, there's quite a few other people who look who regularly re regularly get informant reports of personality spousal report you know things things like that you know like jackie smith at university of michigan had uh, in the hrs you had had spousal uh, uh measures of personality so there there is like some non-software report stuff that's out there but you're right most of it is most of it is self-report the other thing is like behavioral measures on um, uh, there are some people who have done some pioneering work on uh, uh, like, you know, like the, the behavioral residue that comes off of personality. So Sam Gosling at the University of Texas, uh, like looks at, at, at people's, in, their environment and, you know, extroverts have on their, on their desks, you know, when we used to have desks, not really just works at home, but, but like, um, you know, the people had, extroverts would have pictures of people on their desks, you know, whereas like an introvert would have like, you know, pictures of, you know, trees and animals and things like that, you know, and, um, you know, people's like, CD collection. People used to have CD collections. You know, people who are high in openness to experience would have would have, would have highly diverse uh, CD collections. Some classical, some jazz, you know, some you know, some rock. You know, whereas like people who are lower or more close, you know, lower in op op openness to experience would have like just one kind of music. So there are these behavioral measures of personality as well that kind of pick up on this behavioral residue. And there's other ways of measuring personality as well. But self-report is always the easiest. And but you're right. Sometimes there there's flaws with that. Yeah, I think probably your Zoom background now is the, <laughs> the best indicator of your personality. Um, I was gonna say one of my favorite models of personality is Wolf Leeson's model. 
um, where he did these momentary assessments of the big five, these things that are supposed to be like your traits frozen. And what he finds are a couple of really interesting things. The first thing is that almost everybody behaves, let's take extroversion as, as an example, almost everybody over the course of a few days will behave in an extremely extroverted fashion and an extremely introverted fashion. But the shape of the distribution is what distinguishes an introvert from an extrovert. So, you know, one's sort of skewed one way, one's skewed the other way. Um, and the other thing that he found that I find kind of reassuring in a way is that the mean of that distribution correlates pretty well with these self-report measures. Um, so I think, you know, in, in one sense you say like, well, we've asked people how they typically are, why are they changing? Maybe the measure is bad. But on the other hand, when we ask people what they're typically like, maybe they're just aggregating over the past week and they seem to do that very effectively. And of course you would expect that to change over time. Last thing, um, with the um, invention of smartphones and the internet, we are all leaving traces. And so there's a guy at Stanford, Michal Kozinski, who has done an amazing job exploiting that. So it's difficult to get at openness, you know, if, 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 if you're looking in daily behavior because openness happens in the mind, right? In the way you orient towards new stimuli and opportunities. Um, so one thing he looked at likes. What do you like on the internet? It turns out that he can measure whether you are open extremely well by what you like, you know? And so it's a very different way of going about looking at personality. Another thing they've done uh, that's a little scary is where they have analyzed the things that people write. So there's, you have a large corpus of writing. It turns out people low in agreeableness curse a lot and express a lot of anger and frustration and want to blow things up. Well, you know, that you can now measure because people feel very free to express themselves, you know, with words on the internet. So we're, we're making progress, but the one thing I should say, it, you know, Walter Michel came up with this brilliant delay of gratification task. And one of my colleagues is a, is a, is a student of Walter's. And she said it was brilliant because the, the, um, the cookies or the marshmallows that you get as a reward works perfectly for those four to six year olds. We have not been able to find that kind of gold standard measure anywhere else. I offered my nine year old a marshmallow to load the dishwasher and she said, dad, I can buy a whole bag of them on my own. Okay, so there is a, there, you know, we're going to have to deal with constructs, with things that we infer from multiple converging operations, and we're making progress, but it's, it's slow, it's hard work. And I think we should say that the marshmallow test works on four to six year olds who are white from privileged families. That's right, yes. All right, go ahead. Uh, so first, I want to say that I have worked with Emily Wilroth. So, um, you know, I sure, was, rub it in. I was Thanks. on her. I was on her Thanks dissertation committee. So, you know, you know, just so you know that. Uh, and I also take offense to your uh, obscenity point because those of us who grew up in Boston uh, may be perfectly agreeable. We just uh, like to drop a lot of f bombs along the way. So, uh, so I'm thinking. I'm over here thinking about the. I think it was. I think I'm getting it right, 1958 JAMA paper introducing the type A construct, right? Uh, which was uh, kind of a personality construct. And, and, and the original paper connected it to uh, cardiovascular outcomes, right? Uh, interestingly, uh, not um, mortality, but cardiovascular events. And then this set off a wave of people kind of trying to chase that down with a lot of a lack of success. And in the end, it turned it out to be uh, specifically the anger and hostility piece. And now we've worked up, you know, with animal models and, and, and various pursuits, uh, a pretty good model of why that is, you know, there's torsion on the endothelium from the browsal and et cetera. And, and I'm, so I'm trying to think about these big constructs and I'm thinking about type A, you know, being a big wide construct. It wasn't just anger and hostility, it was anger and hostility and timeliness and wanting to be in charge and other things. So then I think about the facet, you know, uh, uh, piece that, that uh, Oliver mentioned. So we're trying to put this all together and I guess actually following the last couple of comments, like how do we get to a precision representation of personality, 
right, what it is and how it functions and how that unfolds in a way that really gets us down to that level of, of granularity of it confers additional risk for health because I do this, I think this, I approach the world in such a way that leads to certain behaviors that leads to um, and, and speaking of WashU, I think of a preprint that Emery Beck and Josh Jackson have online right now where they very successfully, like 80, 85% accuracy predicted uh, things like procrastination and some other stuff. I'm kind of not remembering. It's a little late. My brain's a little foggy. But, you know, so, and, and of course, Emery and Josh are work in this area, you know, personality type research. So I'm going on way too long and I'm being very long winded, which is a bad habit of mine. But, you know, so I'm just putting it to you all, like, how do we get to that level where we can really distill, 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 still be talking about personality, but really kind of distill to that granular mechanistic level. So sorry, I took so long to say that. Yeah, I think you're talking about like an kind of active ingredient approach. So, you know, what we found is that of all of those type A traits, hostility was the active ingredient. Um, that goes to Howard's idea that we need to know why, what are the pathways? And I think what, you know, one thing you can do is just sort of break down the construct and look at which piece of it is, is predicting health. Another is to be a little more intentional about it. If you know something about the pathway that may tell you something about what the active ingredient is. Well, Emery, Emery Beck actually is one of my other postdocs right now. And, um, oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and I, what, 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 she's, what, she, what she's trying to do is very similar to uh, the keynote that we heard earlier today, uh, Mike, Mike Snyder, I think, uh, where he was putting up those individual, like those, you know, like he put up those, like, you know, they, those 17 dots, that's me, you know? And, and so like, she's trying to do the same kind of thing with personality to, you know, it's kind of like, you know, get away, you know, get away from like these kind of like more overall trajectories and like what are the kind of idiosyncratic like you know like kind of dyna dynamics that 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 uh, defines a particular person and then how does that influence uh like later health outcomes you know so she's trying to get down to that kind of more idiosyncratic level um it's really hard it takes a lot of data um our keynote speaker from earlier from this afternoon had had a lot of data that was one of the questions you know it was like oh you you have like all this data you know so um you know it, it, need, it require it, it's really high data requirements you know but like um you, really with any kind of variable you can put together those kinds of like individualized personalized precision you know like you know, kind of like like data dynamics for that that are, that are at the level of the individual um and just to add on to some of the stuff uh, Suzanne was mentioning like there's kind of two ways of thinking about the precision here that were mentioned in the question, one of which is something I know we have to deal with a lot of like, isn't it X? Like, it, yeah, isn't it this? Isn't it neuroticism? Yeah, it's always neuroticism. Yeah, it's always the big five. That silly big five. Okay. Um, and we're always having to deal with that kind of question to try to like control, like, do, do you control for those other things that are whole, uh, highly related, which is not usually the it's right not answer. psychometrically yeah. sound to do yeah. that it's not a and good also idea. you notice it never goes the other way around no. like you never get a neuroticism paper and a reviewer says well isn't maybe this is just optimism right right it's or you you know they said like yeah. maybe this is just sense of purpose no, you never, never get it the way. other way around yeah um but we had uh put forward something uh just like suzanne was saying of you know, maybe the way of going about this is to disentangle things by the mechanism. Like if you think about gratitude and you think about forgiveness and you think about sense of purpose, all three of these things that I've done work on are related positively, but they all are related to health for likely different reasons, depending on kind of your worldview, depending on your goal direction and so forth. So I think that's one way of trying to get at this precision question, um, just echoing what you already said. I agree with her. Um, but then uh, the other way that you alluded to in the question is going back to the type A uh, arguments and there's this whole literature like the cancer prone personality or the blank prone personality that if that is the precision that you're looking for, if like precise prediction of blank, like that's another way of going about this that's less like theory driven and more machine learning driven or more precise on kind of the prediction side of things, which is not typically the way that we've been thinking about it as we've talked up here. But that's one of the reasons why like the type A 
kind of stuck around for a bit or the cancer prone personality kind of stuck around for a yeah. bit in terms of precisely predicting the outcome. Unfortunately, the data have not supported that kind of like there's a disease, yes. a disease prone <laughs> personality. Um, a lot of those data, and these are older data, um, had to do with people's personality after they were already ill. And of course, we know that there are things that change personality. Well, we know this now, right? Back then, it's like, oh, you got frozen at 30. So, uh, you know, it must have caused this. But um, I'll give you an example. So um, I do some work in ALS. And a long time ago, there was this idea of the ALS prone personality um, in which people were thought to be not depressed enough and um, too controlling or agentic uh, in their approach to life. And basically this was just a discrepancy between how people actually feel who have ALS and how the doctors felt they should feel. Like they thought they should feel depressed and helpless. And when they weren't, they were like, all of these people have such a weird personality. Maybe it's causing their disease. So you know, type A predicts a bunch of different health outcomes and type C predicts a bunch of different health outcomes. So we're, we're not getting that kind of precision really in the data now. Let me quickly chime in. That was Aaron Fisher's last question. Um, we now know that you can go further down and uh, if the type A people in their first paper had looked at all the items that they had available to see whether the phenomenon, the prediction replicates for all of their items, they could have saved the field a lot of time. About right? 40 years, yeah. Yes, yeah. So the idea is somebody gives you a measure, you let, you know, let's say you're using the big five inventory, you know, there are 60 items. Well, look at all 60 items. There's no reason why you have to be stuck with a 12 that we say is, is, is a good measure of conscientiousness. I mean, we know that the facets differentially relate to important outcomes. So break it down further. There's now a literature that says individual items, when we ask somebody a question, why not look at that? And if you're finding you, you get the same thing for all six items, great, but, but look at it. So break the constructs out. I think Aaron, Aaron made a good point there. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. Thanks so much for this. Um, I'm Delwin Catley from Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Um, I, I was just thinking about when I've considered including personality scales in like um, uh, intervention trials, I've often gone, oh, well, you know, can't change personality in a 12 week intervention or whatever it is. Uh, best not put a lot of my items on, on personality scales. Um, how should I think about how likely it is to change personality, do you think? I, I assume it should be harder than like changing motivation, which is what I'm usually trying to do. Um, how do you, how do you, isn't that what makes it personality that it's hard to change? No. Okay, so, <laughs> but, but then what, you know, if it's, if it's not, what's the difference between motivation and, a, and some kind of personality factor? This is a really hard question, by the way. Um, that's why I just said no and stopped there. I'll let let you guys maybe. And Dan is an optimist, so we will. Okay, start. we'll let we'll let him hold forth on that. Well, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna like, you know, go, you know, you know, three standard deviations, you know, like, you know, or you know, in in um, especially in a short period of time. Uh, most change would, you know, would, would would occur over a period of, you know. Uh, you know, months or, or years, it, it's, it's, it's possible, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the meta-analysis that, 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 that was a co-author on indicated that, yeah, it, it could happen over a faster uh, time period, but is it sustained? That, 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 that's not, not clear. Um, you know, but like, 
So the typical change would be, you know, maybe half standard deviation, three quarters of a standard deviation, you know, that, that occurs over, over the course of, you know, kind of like the, you know, the best way to think about it is like how fast do like, say, you know, like children, you know, if, if it's something that, that we measure regularly in children, like reading skill or math skill, you know, so, you know, so, you know, there's growth curves on that. And so, um, you know, so it's not going to like, you know, it's not like you're going to teach a kid to read like, you know, in like one month, you know, the, that's going to be a process. It's, you know, it's going to, it's going to take a little bit of time. But yes, will reading ability or reading skill change? Of course it will. You know, and you can see it from age, you know, from, from kindergarten to third grade. Oh, yeah, you know, kids, you know, kids, their 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 reading skill like certainly develops. So personality change is probably best. Uh, uh, the, the best analogy is to like cognitive functioning variables like that, things like things like things like reading skill and math skill. That that the the, the pace of change is going to be something along along those lines. Yes, there's change. Is it like like change that's whipping around real fast, you know, back and forth? No, probably not. Probably not. It's not going to be like emotion, which you know, where there, there's a much more labile kind of you know pattern, um, you know. But 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 the the, the the change will be there. It just will be you know over a, a slower period of time, and probably not you know going from like the fifth percentile to the ninety fifth percentile. That would be very extreme change, and like you would rarely see that. Yeah. Um, and to address the other part of the question. When you're asking like the difference between motivation and personality, the answer is yes. Mo motivation is part of personality uh, that we kind of started this whole discussion, this whole debate, you know, focused on traits or focused on dispositions. But of course, there's a lot of great work by Dan McAdams and others pointing to how personality is an accumulation of traits, goals, motives, and so forth. And there's a few studies that have linked motives and traits, and this could be part of the cognitive signature of, you know, approach motivation as part of extroversion and other aspects of these traits. So I, I don't think that we should be thinking of this as like, is it motivation or personality? It's all part of personality. It's just part of part of the trait or linked to the trait, or maybe as uh, like the Alamond and Flukerger model would suggest, like this might be something kind of at that middle tier, like the habits or motives that you might be able to then move up the ladder to changing the disposition as well. So it's not a no, but it's kind of a yes and, like we, we get to claim that construct too as a personality psychologist. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And I think, you, you know, the figure was very nice. It's like, oh, we have like behaviors down here and then we have habits here and then we have personality up here, but those borders are not well-defined. They're very blurry. And so something like motivation probably has some kind of stable component to it that some people are just more motivated than other people to do whatever the behavior is, um, but also change. and. And I really, if you have, we probably need more than five minutes to read this paper, but if you have any interest in this, I really encourage you to read Fleeson's paper in JPSP about this because it will change the way that you think about personality. And, and you'll think about somebody's personality, not as like this fixed point, but as a distribution of behaviors. And it has a standard deviation and it has, a min and a max, and it has a mean and a median, and all of those things capture something slightly different about personality, but it, it, it nicely integrates that idea that you have sort of a central point that you gravitate to, but there's a lot of variation around that point from moment to moment or day to day. So we have time for one very quick last question because you are ready to ask it and then we are supposed to wrap it up. Well, I'm Karen Weiss, I'm from Arizona. And um, I'm sorry to say that this is probably not quick, but since I was ready to say it, I'll put it out there anyway. Um, thinking about health and personality, uh, a couple of things came to mind. One is uh, Johan Denele's work on type D personality. Uh, in which he's found that people who are um, desiring social connection but very isolated have gro grossly increased uh, cardiovascular uh, poor outcomes. And then also the old uh, repressive coping construct where people are highly anxious 
and more, or, well, high, more or less anxious and more or less into social desirability. Um, so it seems like there's this interpersonal um, aspect of type D and repressive coping and uh, Lorna Benjamin Sasby um, that I haven't really heard us talking about, but it just seemed like it was worth putting that on the table and asking how you all think of that going on the mix, but it's probably way too big a, a, a subject. So just putting it out there. Ask Tim Smith about type D and he will give you chapter and verse. I can't, I can't, I just can't, but, um, but Tim will. Okay. And um, there, are, there are so many issues with that measure that we would be here all night. So, but Tim can absolutely explain it. I think also some of these things as you're describing them are indica indicative of interactions, right? Like someone has a lot of negative emotion, but they're not expressive. So it's this, it's an interaction. And some of the problems with these measures is that conceptually they are interactions just like that. Or um, Walter Michel would say they're if then profiles. Um, but psychometrically people are not testing the interaction. Hmm. And so sometimes you get like, oh, well, you just add up all these main effects, therefore this predicts when actually it's just a jingle jangle problem. The only other thing I, I, I'll add to that is when we think about the coping piece of the question, like there's a lot of meta, like Connor, Flaxbart, Connor Smith and Flaxbart, um, there was a meta analysis on personality traits and coping styles. And I think this is one way of thinking about that is how those coping styles help to explain the mechanisms that we've all been trying to search for in that regard of uh, people who are more extroverted versus introverted might be seeking out different social strategies for their support. Um, and you know, we see with like purposeful individuals, they're more like problem focused copers, which kind of makes sense. If you're somebody who's goal directed and focusing on this path for your life, um, those coping mechanisms may really play an important role in trying to find these routes by which personality is leading to health. So I think you're hitting on something really important here as we talk a lot about health behaviors as like the main pathway linking traits to health, but the coping style and the way that you're seeking out social support or social connections is going to be equally, if not more important on that front too. So yeah. on, on that note really quickly, I mean, the, where that literature has gone is more, more to emotion regulation. How do, you, how do we deal with these emotionally intense situations and how do we deal with our own experience, right? Because you can get anxious about, you know, that I'm going to be anxious in a, in a moment, right? So you get um, these anticipatory uh, reactions as well. So I think there's lots of interesting things. Um, so James Gross is one of the folks at Stanford that's been really pushing on that emotion regulation agenda. So that might be a good place to look. Thank you so much. Yeah, Great. I was, yeah, let me just, I'll just add, I have a plug. Um, I was asked by annual review of psychology to write a review on personality and coping. But Chuck Carver and Connor Smith had just written this beautiful review about personality and coping. I'm like, what's left for me to do? Um, and so I was talking with a colleague of mine whose name is Greg Smith. And I pitched him this idea and it worked out kind of nicely for us. It has to do with this sort of bottom up version of personality. And what we were proposing is that a lot of personality traits having to do with emotion and emotion regulation come from a bottom up way. It's just your habitual way of coping with emotion. Um, so we're talking about things like emotional approach coping and that Stanton's construct. And um, we talked about alexithymia as being one of these kind of aggregation of your habitual ways of coping. And it just shows that kind of blurred line between what's habit and what's personality. It's, you, can, you can say that hab, a habitual way of doing something is a personality trait. And sometimes we've named those. So um, that's an annual review, just a little pitch. So there. I'm supposed to end on an optimistic 
message here, which is that personality can change. Your own personality, you still have some years to make those changes. There is intentional personality change. There's the PEACH program. So go out and change yourself and maybe some other people can change as well. Open those minds. And hopefully we're gonna see more good, good personality research coming out of these longitudinal studies where health is monitored. So include the measures, include them frequently, not just once as you've um, heard. And I hope in five to 10 years, uh, this gang is going to come back and say, look what we found. So thank you so much. Thank you for sticking with us. So interesting, I forgot to cut you off. <laughs> it was long, it was absolutely amazing, thank you. Okay, so, so um, if it's your bedtime or you need to change activities,